Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, happy 2020, welcome to the new year. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our very first speaker for the new year, uh, Dr. Jamal Murray Javier, uh, from our Department of Geriatric Intensive Medicine. I'm sure you've all worked with her before, um, so she's here to give us a lecture on uh, symptom management, um, non, 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 <coughs> non pain symptom management in serious illness. So thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for talking about us. Thanks everyone for inviting me. So the topic is really for um, primary care providers and clinicians to be able to um, know how to manage um, uh, non-pain symptoms. Um, and really I wanted to focus on recent updates in terms of pharmacotherapy and other types of interventions. I have, don't have any financial disclosures. Just wanted to acknowledge a few of my colleagues who have contributed in part to the slide set I've taken um, some slide sets from their already existing um, work, body of work, because they're, some of them are experts in certain um, areas of the, of the talk. So I really wanted to uh, highlight some general guidelines for assessing and managing three common non-pain symptoms. If it were just up to me and I would have sort of like the time and the luxury to discuss all the non-pain symptoms, it will be a lot more than these three. But I thought that these are, you know, one of the, the three of the most, the more common ones. Um, and I mostly bump it into the GIP, so nausea, vomiting, constipation, and then anorexia, cachexia. And how to kind of like, just, you know, um, a good refresher course in terms of, you know, basic assessment and management. And I also wanted to provide recent updates within the last five years in terms of medical management of pain symptoms in the seriously ill patient. So these are patients with chronic progressive serious illness, um, both cancer and non-cancer that we can perhaps um, you know, that we're, that we're taking care of and perhaps think about uh, interventions that might be appropriate for them. So I wanted to slide with this, uh, I wanted to start with this slide, um, and this was actually lifted from a paper of one of my colleagues as well, Andy Kelly and Sean Morrison, and they, you know, looked at symptom prevalence in terms of advanced illness, and as you can see, so, you know, it's um, a bit of a busy graph, but it, it does give you a little bit of information as to based on their... Uh, it doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't. You know what, I'll just use this one. So, um, you know, like how they divided the symptoms into like pain, breathlessness, fatigue, anorexia, and everything else. And then they describe all the different organ systems that are sort of afflicted um, and have in patients with progressive disease. So let's say for COPD, you know, the top three is breathlessness, which is uh, not uncommon, um, followed by fatigue, and I want to say the yellow one, which is dry mouth fatigue. And let's say for dementia, you have um, breathlessness, uh, could be part of this, secondary to perhaps pneumonia. Um, and then you have constipation as the second one. And then pain is also a, a common symptom in terms of um, advanced illness. So this just gives you a flavor of the different symptom com uh, 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 complexes that are included in patients who uh, manifest with any of these diseases. So we start with a case, and some of these are lifted from um, fictitious cases, and some are, you know, uh, real cases. So Mr. Oscar Madison has a metastatic prostate cancer. He was recently started on an oral regimen of morphine to treat his uh, painful bony metastases. He complains, I'm feeling sick to my stomach, so he started me on morphine, I'm going to throw up. Now, what can you do as a provider to help him, whether you're a PA, nurse practitioner, a physician, um, you know, an intern? What can you do to help him in terms of uh, his complaint? So he has two things going on here. It's uh, pain and then he's feeling sick to his stomach. So the first is nausea and vomiting. We all know that nausea is a subjective sensation, and, you know, that is describable from a patient standpoint. We know that there are, there are multiple afferent pathways because, you know, our organ systems are lined with receptors that, um, bind to, um, or the send signals to the brain, especially when we have abnormal toxins and chemical imbalances in the body. So these are afferent pathways come in these four um, organs, right? The gastrointestinal lining, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, in the cerebral cortex, and the other <coughs> apparatus in cerebral cortex, or four areas, two organs. And the vomiting uh, mechanism is really more of a neuromuscular reflex. So once you already have your, um, you know, your stimulated uh, opioid receptors and then send signals uh, via the spinothalamic tract, 
the, the cerebral <laughs> cortex will then try to um, process, you know, the sensation and then in turn send signals back down to the different organs, especially the GI tract, to create vomiting, which is, you know, the neuromuscular reflex here via the corticospinal pathway. So this is just a good uh, cartoon of, you know, the different areas in the brain as well as um, extra uh, cranial sort of structures that are implicated in nausea and vomiting. So we have the central nervous system where the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, hypothalamus, and meninges are sort of the, the bearers for um, effects from a current pathway signaling, whether it's toxins or other chemicals. You have the vestibular system and you have, in each of the, the areas of the brain, there is the associated receptors and the type of neurotransmitter that are implicated. And the reason why we need to highlight this is the fact that a lot of our medications will rely heavily on targeted therapies based on the neurotransmitter and based on the receptors that we're actually dealing with. So the vestibular system has the acetylcholine and um, histamine uh, type 1 receptor. The chemoreceptor trigger zone is um, actually located in the area of prostroma, which is in the floor of the fourth ventricle. And... Um, because of the name itself, you know, it's self-explanatory, there are chemoreceptors, it does mediate dopamine and neurokinine, and also the 5-HT3, which is your serotonin um, agonist. And in the vomiting center is somewhere in the medulla via the nucleus tractus solitarius, and it has all of these neurotransmitters as well, to include neurokinine 1, um, substance B, which is much more in, the, um, in central and peripheral as well, as um, you do have the interplay of other receptors, mechano and chemo receptors in the GI tract, <clears throat> the heart, as well as in your autonomic nervous system as well. So the 11 M's, when we think about nausea and vomiting, is pretty straightforward, right? And I think, you know, everyone who's not rocket science, you guys all know this, but I think it's a, it's a good, um, you know, acronym or letter to, uh, you know, to think about when... <coughs> when dealing with somebody with nausea and vomiting as we're trying to think about all the different causes. So metastasis, meningeal irritation, mobility, anxiety, medications that are used, mucosal irritation, mechanical obstruction is a big thing, motility, metabolic issues, microbes, myocardial. And a more simplistic way of remembering sort of the different causes in LDA, and this is not necessarily all inclusive, but at least it gives you a little bit of a flavor to kind of like just think about the, the major causes of nausea and vomiting. You know, the, the acronym VOMIT, so V is vestibular, O is any type of obstructive process going on, M is this motility, I is infection inflammation, and T, toxins stimulating the chemoreceptor trigger zone, whether they're medications, chemical imbalances, and other um, neurotransmitters that are sort of are out of line. In the management, so when we think about that, I already alluded to this earlier, when we think about the pathophysiology of nausea and vomiting and thinking about all the different areas in the brain as well as in the extracranial sites, we want to think about targeted therapies for, um, uh, you know, the nausea and vomiting. So definitely we can classify the pharmacotherapies based on the neurotransmitters that it actually blocks. So whether they're dopamine antagonists, antihistamines, anticholinergics, and a whole host of these, you know, different classes of medications. So the next few slides are really tables, and this is the most recent one, and this is from the journal Primary Care um, by, an, by an outpatient doc who was interested in looking at non-pain symptom management for um, individuals with serious illness, and as well as like uh, even those who are pre-serious in the, in the primary care setting. And he, you know, was uh, nicely uh, divided it into, you know, the drug type, the receptors, the indications, the dosage and the routes, adverse effects, and, um, you know, other notes, you know, for, in for instance, renal and liver considerations, let's say for haloperidol. So if you look at um, the butyrophenones and the prokinetic agents, there's definitely an effect on D2, so D2 antagonism, and also which is, you know, uh, mediated in the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And then it goes down the line to phenothiazines as well. Antihistamines have a little bit of a different um, neurotransmitter apart from the chemoreceptor trigger zone. It does have the H1, um, and what's not included here is the acetylcholine piece as well. So I'm not going to go through each of them. I think that this is a good use in your, in your uh, pocket tools to kind of refer to when you think about uh, non-pain uh, medications for nausea and vomiting. 
And then your anticholinergic agents, the 5-HD3 and K1 and the mirtazapine, these are all, again, agents that we use. Um, what, what is included in the, uh, the second column here is really the neurotransmitters that it's um, affecting and so forth. Dosing, indications, adverse effects, and whatnot. Some of them we use, uh, some of them we don't. You know, some uh, other specialists will be able to use aprepitan, for instance. Um, I have yet to see a, a cl clinical, uh, you know, primary care provider use aprepitan for a specific reason. Because for the most part, aprepitan, for instance, is um, was initially studied for people with um, acute and delayed nausea and vomiting for uh, cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. The 5-HD3 antagonist, I think this is one of the more common. So at least in our system, we use either a dopamine antagonist like Reglan, um, or we use a 5-HD3 antagonist such as, um, you know, Ondansetron. Uh, and then the rest are sort of, uh, you know, other 5-HD3 antagonists that we don't typically use, or they're not really used because they're either expensive, not available, and again, we're not necessarily the primary specialists um, recommending them. And it seems to be, a, a, you know, like the uh, first choice that a lot of the providers have. I would say that between a dopamine antagonist and a serotonin antagonist, my bias is towards a dopamine antagonist only because it's effective, it's um, cheaper. Um, both can cause QTC prolongation, both can cause constipation. So I also factor in sort of the cost effectiveness and, and whatnot. And try to mix the different types of classes of drugs based on the indications and whether or not you're actually achieving the desired effect, which is to control the nausea and vomiting. Um, and then you have your typical antipsychotics and other agents such as corticosteroids and dexamethasone. I believe I have another slide set. Again, I'm not going to go into much detail in, in any of them. They're self-explanatory and it's very clear cut in this setting. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time. I do want to call attention to some of the other adjuvant medications that we use for nausea and vomiting. And again, it really depends on the indications, the compelling <clears throat> indications, right? So dexamethasone is very useful for somebody with inflammation. And if, if you have increased intracranial pressure from a CNS standpoint, and that's something that we can definitely use, or for capsular stretch of the liver, there is some data to say that we can use that as well. If we think that capsular stretch in the liver um, definitely leads to nausea and vomiting. <laughs> Benzodiazepines like lorazepam, helpful for anticipatory nausea and vomiting. It's, it's not a first-line medication, but when we do identify that a patient would benefit from it, then we obviously want to be able to use it. And passes H2 blocker CPI for obvious reasons. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of our patients have reflux and or, you know, um, gastritis, um, esophagitis, and these are medications that can definitely be helpful as well, cytoprotective agents, and also a triotype, which for the most part, you know, us clinicians here would, would use and the GI folks as well would use this if we think that there is GI you know, obstruction, a lot of secretions going on, um, nausea and vomiting. So definitely a good uh, medication. It's sub-Q, it's a bit expensive. Again, for people who are patients who are definitely a good um, candidate for a triotype use, definitely, because it, it constricts the splanchnic circulation. The next few slides, I wanted to zero in a little bit more with uh, much more specific in terms of the, the class types of drugs um, and specific uh, class of drugs that we use for nausea and vomiting because there has been some recent updates in terms of th these medications. So what is very popular is ondansetron. Granisetron is actually an older medication that has been reformulated because uh, they wanted to extend it and have a little bit of a longer half-life. The lacitron is also an older medication, an older generation of um, 5-HD4. Uh, Palonocetron is probably one of the newer ones. And we know that they act on the chemoreceptor trigger zone, vagal stimulation, parasympathetic stimulation. And primarily, these medications were initially really started um, to, be looked at, to be looked into in terms of its efficacy in chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. That's why I don't really want to use this as first line because the primary indication was really chemotherapy and nausea and vomiting. However, we've also come to know that over the last few years, um, there has been more resurgence of um, newer indications like it's, it's good for post-operative nausea and vomiting, post-XRT, and people with refractory nausea. And if you think that dopamine antagonists are no longer really helpful to, you know, as first line, then definitely there is an indication to use um, your 5-HD4 uh, antagonist. So 5-HD3. So the cost is could be prohibitive for long QTC constipation. Look at that. 
Palonisetron is a, a drug that was actually approved in 2008 by FDA for acute and delayed chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And how do we define acute and delayed? So acute, um, a, a, acute nausea and vomiting that's chemotherapy-related is within the first 24 hours after they've gotten or exposed to chemotherapy, and delayed is anywhere from after 24 hours to 72 hours. So palonisetron was um, FDA approved in 2008, uh, as an IV, and then a recent in 2015, I want to say 14 or 15, it then got approval for its oral equivalent. Um, and it, this is also an expensive drug. It has a uh, 62% protein binding, metabolized in the liver, half life is 40 hours. Hence, it's a good medication for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting because it does stay in your system for a little bit of time. Um, and then the cost is about $60 per uh, 2 ml that contains 0.25 milligrams. And um, the NK1 receptor antagonist is the, the, the other newer sort of agents in terms of um, managing chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And the, 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 the mechanism here is it's a neurokinin-1 um, antagonism and also substance B. Uh, and it definitely has an augmentation, uh, augmenting activity with the 5-HD3 receptor antagonist. It's a good mixed with, you know, serotonin antagonists. It does cross the blood-brain barriers. It could, you know, um, cause delirium. Fos apropitan, which is the IV formulation, is actually the pro-drug for apropitan. Um, it does last in your system for about half a day, and it does come with side effects as well as indicated below. The bad thing about apropitan, apart from its cost, is that it can be um, uh, you know, it has multiple drug interactions, like if patients are on antibiotics and, and chemotherapy and whatnot, and we know that our patients in the hospital, they're on multiple meds. So um, it, we just need to be careful with that. I did not, it could not be seen, I don't know why this slide looked like this, but um, it's about $100 per pill, um, particularly with the oral formulation. Rolapitant is the newest of the bunch, and this was approved way back in 2015-16. Um, it also has a long half-life at seven days, maximum concentration about four hours, and you take it orally, elimination via the feces and the urine. It's about 378 for a 90 milligram tablet. So in 2016, um, you know, this uh, review article um, actually came up with some kind of a summary in terms of the different uh, 5-HD3 and also the the NK1 substance B inhibitors. And um, the newest ones that we that I, have, I, have, I highlighted here is the netupitant and rolapitant. And again, without going into much detail, suffice it to say that these medications have longer half-lives. It is cost prohibitive because it is expensive. Um, and the combination between an NK1 and a 5-HT3, as you already indicated in the previous slide, has this augmenting activity. So patients are actually um, you know, feeling uh, they feel better when you when you have this um, combination, especially when it's associated with cancer and chemotherapy. Um, the other mechanism that they wanted to highlight in this review article in 2016 was the neuromodulatory medication, such as tricyclic an uh, antidepressants, your mirtazapine, olanzapine, risperidone, and gabapentin even. So gabapentin, as we know, is a calcium channel blocker, right? It reduces voltage uh, calcium channels to prevent cyclic GMP in your system and um, sort of uh, affects the calcium signaling and hence you'll have less um, hypercalcemia and, you know, causing nausea and vomiting. So um, it's actually indicated for post-operative as well as chemotherapy induced. And in this, you know, slide, again, it just highlights all the different mechanisms of the other neuromodulatory medications. They called it neuromodulatory because they think that the, the effects of the pharmacokinetic effects of these medications, or pharmacodynamic effects of these medications are actually uh, helpful in desensitizing the gut in terms of, um, you know, stimulation for nausea and vomiting. That's why it's called neuromodulatory. So I got this article back in 2015. It was from um, a cancer article, and they looked at um, uh, granisetron, which, I, as I said, was reformulated. This is an older 5-HD3 reformulated to a more longer-acting one, um, and then they compared it with palonisetron, which is a newer agent. And I think the the um, the premise here is that, well, first of all, granisetron is a lot cheaper than palonisetron, and they, feel, they wanted to see the efficacy of this new reformulation. 
And what they looked at, if you look at the, um, you know, the comparison between um, these agents, so they had Balonacetron in the coral color. You have, uh, this is the Granicetron 250 milligram sub-Q and Granicetron 500 milligram sub-Q. What they found was that even though there's no statistical difference, there's definitely a trend that um, there is a response in for acute um, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, there is an, a response of about 70% in, in patients who are affected. In delayed, it's a lot lower because by then, um, yeah, so I can't really explain to you why the, the delayed piece and maybe it just has to do with um, uh, maybe the neurotransmitters in your system and didn't really explain, people didn't really explain why there was also a reduction, uh, albeit there's still a more than 50% response in terms of um, delayed chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And then they also um, compared it with, um, with another table using uh, the same dose and also the same, uh, the same doses for both and the same drugs. So again, the, bottom, the takeaway point here is that there is in fact at least more than 70% um, uh, you know, uh, complete response rate. And there's really no superiority of one agent over the other. And, you know, in this day and age, if you are able to find an efficacious drug that is also cost effective, then you tend to favor the one that's, you know, cost effective as well. So let's shift gears to medical cannabis, because there's a lot of like interest in medical cannabis as uh, an agent for nausea and vomiting, right? So we know that we have endogenous and exogenous cannabinoid receptors in the system. What is probably most uh, used, uh, you know, uh, synthetically is the THC, which is an exogenous um, cannabinoid in our, and also your cannabidiol. So this just uh, tells you that uh, this is the, the plant, the cannabis sativa, which um, obviously is an exogenous form of, um, of cannabis and that can bind to the cannabinoid receptors in multiple areas of our body, from the brain all the way down to the adipose tissue, the immune system, and the gut. This is just a, a cartoon showing the different um, locations of the cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2 receptors in your system. What we're really interested in here is the exogenous cannabinoids, um, because these are the ones that we have synthetic formulations on and the ones that we actually use in symptomatic care. So these are the formulations. It could come as a capsule, as an oil, as a vaporizer. Um, no, it's very straightforward. The effects, you know, we know that it's good for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. It's good for pain. It's good for appetite stimulation, both in HIV and cancer patients. Um, but what is also known is that Magistrol is consistently more effective for, um, for you know, appetite stimulation compared to endocannabinoids. And I will show you the data supporting that. Some types of seizures, um, anxiety, sleep, and then the rest. It does have significant adverse events. Sedation is a big one. Dizziness is another one. Euphoria is another one. Nausea and vomiting. These are sort of like the um, effects that um, cannabinoids have on the, the patient's experience. And I'm not going to go through this, but I just wanted to highlight that there are um, multiple uh, medical conditions that cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoids, um, synthetic, can certainly be helpful. Um, neurodegenerative disease, cancer, HIV, cachexia, um, and you need to be able to have uh, this, uh, you know, diagnosis to be able to be approved for, for medical marijuana. So the most common illnesses from 2016 to 2018 that are common serious illness and among patients certified to use for medical marijuana is um, chronic pain over 50% neuropathies and cancer. And as you know, people who are about 50 have the higher um, usage of medical marijuana and only 5% are terminally ill. So what does the federal law say? So marijuana is a schedule one drug and it's not recognized by the federal government for medical use. The FDA has not approved a marketing application for cannabis. Um, and then under this amendment, the Justice Department cannot <laughs> interfere with state medical mar um, marijuana. And as of August 2019, 33 states and D.C. have allowed for medical cannabis. So this is, this is um, still a work in progress, and there's a lot of interest from multiple stakeholders. Uh, and then Governor Cuomo in 2014 uh, passed the Compassionate Care Act, uh, you know, approving a safe and effective medical marijuana program. New York State 
the patient must be eligible based on specific serious conditions, must have a registered identification card with Department of Health, and can have access to any of the formulations below. <coughs> this is the most important piece. Despite extensive changes in policy at the state level and the rapid rise in the use of cannabis, both for medical purposes and for recreational use, conclusive evidence regarding the short and long-term health effects of cannabis use remains elusive. A lack of scientific research has resulted in a lack of information on the health implications of cannabis use, which is a significant public health concern for vulnerable populations such as pregnant women and adolescents, which for the most part, they're not really included in a lot of the studies. Unlike other substances whose use may confer risks such as alcohol or tobacco, no accepted standards exist to help guide individuals as they make choices regarding the issues of if, when, where, and how to use cannabis safely in regard to therapeutic uses uh, effectively. In the inpatient setting, there are three approved formulations in New York. Mount Sinai Hospital will not allow the use of vaporized products. If patients have medical marijuana, we have to confiscate them, keep them in a safe box, and then once upon discharge, we can give them their medical marijuana. They must always have their state card with them to prove that they are in fact a recipient. And de novo inpatient certifications are not approved. So the patients have to be seen in the outpatient setting with a provider who's willing to um, sign the certification form. So what is the evidence behind cannabis? We've already seen, you know, sort of like the big picture. I want to go into more specific and more recent evidence. So 2018 and 2019 actually mirrored each other because there were two system systematic review and meta-analysis of cannabinoids. Um, and this is in patients with uh, advanced illness and receiving palliative care. So one was this meta-analysis of double-blind or open-label RCT, and they looked at um, multiple medical con conditions such as advanced um, and stage disease, diseases like cancer, dementia, HIV, heart disease. Um, and they really looked at all the databases and pulled all the data. So among these, 108 uh, were screened and only nine were selected from North America. And they comprise um, patients who have terminal advanced cancer, advanced HIV, and Alzheimer's disease. Altogether, there were more than 1,500 patients who were enrolled. They either received synthetic cannabinoids um, in various forms and doses versus placebo. And they wanted to find out if there is, in fact, efficacy in pain control, body weight, appetite, body weight um, gain, appetite improvement, caloric intake, nausea, and vomiting. And then they had like secondary outcomes, looked at tolerability, they also looked at safety. So what, what does the data show? So all the evidence is low quality, low to very low, whether they are um, inhibited by small sample sizes, we know for a fact that there's no significant change in weight gain, caloric intake. There is a trend to maybe some benefit in terms of appetite, but not more so if you use magistral um, acetate, nausea and vomiting, there's no benefit, pain reduction. There might be a trend, but not quite enough. There's no statistical significance here. Um, insomnia, health associated, quality of life, new onset dizziness, and mental health. So the bottom line is that there's poor evidence. There's really not much to support the use of cannabinoids. Weight gain, appetite, and nausea are the same thing. Um, cannabinoids, uh, you know, had more effect than placebo, but the quality of evidence is, again, very low. Um, and in comparison to your megase, magistral acetate had much more of an effect. There was no difference between cannabinoids and placebo in tolerability and safety um, in cancer patients and HIV AIDS patients. So we know that uh, Marinol, for instance, is indicated for people with HIV AIDS. And now we know that the data, even though there might be a trend and might support, it's not, it's poor data and it's not any better or superior than the use of megase. So the key points in the nausea and vomiting piece is you want to be able to identify and treat the causes, rational empiric therapy, think about the neurotransmitters, optimize the single agent first before switching or adding agents, um, always consider the creatinine clearance and the QTC interval. And we also need to think about non-pharmacological interventions. Not everything has to be uh, medication. We can think about integrative therapies that might be helpful, like Reiki, yoga, um, even Tai Chi, which are good um, integrative uh, strategies. Let's move forward to our second case. Uh, Mr. Colfi, the 75-year-old man, multiple medical problems here, dementia, diabetes, hypertension, depression, hypothyroidism. Um, he lives at home. He has some AIADLs, right? He's confined to the wheelchair, related to compression fractures of his spine. Two weeks ago, he was started on oxycodone controlled release because he had back pain, endorsed some good relief. Now he complains of diarrhea. 
he's on these medications, Wellbutrin, Lasix, Fosamax, Synthroid Metformin. Um, and on exam, he had normal vitals, abdominal exam, normal bowel sounds, rectal exam, fasted for impaction. Which of the following medications contributed to Mr. Colfield's uh, fecal um, impaction? You guys want to shout out your answers? Just for our audience participation. <laughs> so that I'm not the only one talking. Okay, who says all of the above? So the answer is all of the above, right? All are contributory, right? Either direct or indirect. So causes of constipation, so autonomic dysfunction, decreased motility, dehydration, ileus malignancy, all of these are important causes of constipation. And one needs to just really be mindful about, you know, all these different pathologies, similar to how you approach nausea and vomiting. There are ways to assess, I don't know why this line is not working, but there are ways to assess how to, um, how to diagnose uh, there are ways to assess uh, constipation, and it could be either through the use of a, a stool chart where you actually visualize the stool. You can use the bowel function index, which is a questionnaire. You can also diagnose it uh, radiographically, where you have to divide the plane app into four quadrants, and then you can kind of map out the most, the percentage of most stools and or your rectal exam. So diseases related to constipation is a multitude. Uh, I don't have to go through each one of them. Suffice it to say that there's multiple reasons, and we need to think about multimorbidity in constipation. The older we get, the more constipated we become. Why? Because of decreased motility, impaired thirst, there are, you know, cognitive impairments, dementia, increased imagine comorbidities, decreased physical activity. And the hazards are, you know, are impactful, right? In present with overflow diarrhea, it can trigger delirium, it can cause nausea and vomiting, hiccups, overall poor quality of life. And it can even lead to severe morbidity and death. Why? Because they end up with severe perforation, impaction, and even infection, peritonitis. So prevention is really the key. And, um, you know, doing the, the bare minimum is really important uh, to be able to at least get a good grasp of, you know, constipation in your older patient. Non-pharmacologic management is um, important. Regular toileting, fluid intake, regular exercise. Um, in fact, there was one data in, in the United Kingdom that looked at uh, regular exercise for patients who are at risk for constipation, and they looked that it is, in fact, associated with lower risk because you promote intestinal, good intestinal transit and gastric emptying. Pharmacologic management, all these different classes of drugs from stimulants to osmotics, stool softeners, bulk laxatives, and prokinetic agents. What is important for stimulant laxatives, such as Senna, Disacodil, and Cascara, is that they stimulate the myocardial plexus, cause small movement in a few hours. It might cause abdominal cramping, and it's definitely contraindicated in intestinal obstruction. And osmotic laxatives, on the other hand, because they're complex sugars, they then bind or attract water into your lumen, and then it distends the lumen, and then causing um, expulsion of your stool. Just be careful with renal disease and CHF. Stool softeners, so they're not really true laxatives, you know, colase, you know, so uh, docacity. Um, it really is as um, uh, an adsorbent. It decreases surface tension and surfactant in a way. Uh, it's really ineffective in older adults because with colase, you have to drink plenty of water, about a liter for it to work, and you need to have at least three pills a day to be effective. <coughs> so this is the data for um, the use of colase. We use it a lot because you know, it's still in sort of like in the hierarchy of um, or arsenal of medications used for constipation that we combine Senna and Docasane. This was a study that was um, recent. I can't remember now the date, the date here, but it was a very recent study. And this was out of uh, in Canada. And it says here that in terms of like the, the, the way that providers um, practice that we use a lot of, uh, of Docasane. In fact, on admission, and this is an inpatient setting, 52% were on Docasane, uh, and then only 33% were on Senna, and then the rest. And then when they leave the hospital, you know, 52% uh, uh, or 47% were, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 47% were not taken before admission, and now it became a new prescription. And, you know, a lot of our patients, because they end up having, you know, symptoms, and then, then they get started with opioids, end up with more constipation. So... The, the moral of, the, of this um, study was that docosate, even though there is lack of efficacy, it's still being used in a lot of our inpatients. So we 
should tend not to use tocosate anymore and tocosate and uh, placenta is not more efficacious than senna alone. Hence this uh, study that was done in 2013. They did an RCT double blind placebo controlled trial of all tocosate and measured the constitution classification. And what they found out was that, so their placebo, so one arm of the patient received tocosate and then the other arm received um, a placebo plus senna. And they, um, uh, tocosate plus senna size and then placebo plus senna. And what they found out was that there was no significant benefit. Everyone had laxation. What it did show is that people are having more polypharmacy because you're adding more pills. There's three pills plus the requirement to drink a liter of fluid. So Senna alone is efficacious and really Colase is um, a confounder. Bulk laxatives, we don't, we try to avoid this in debilitated patients because definitely they can only harden the stools and they, people do not necessarily drink plenty of water. Prokinetics like metoclopramide, good with nausea and vomiting, it does stimulate the bowel, the mitral reflexes causing peristalsis. The problem with metoclopramide is that for a complete bowel obstruction, it's contraindicated and you have to renally dose it and it causes the blood brain barrier. So it can, people can get confused. Erythromycin on the other hand is erythromycin, they're a macroline. But guess what? They also are agonists for the motilin receptor, which is your, your, your motilin, simulates motility protein. And so therefore it can cause um, a lot of um, uh, cramping as well. But you know, people who are on azithromycin and the macrolides, patients endorse that they have loose stools because of that. QTC prolongation is a big one, dystonia, dyskinesia. Uh, large volume enemas, we just, we just need to be really careful with them. And typically, if you have somebody who's really impacted, you have to disimpact them, treat them from above and from below. And we usually use this as a last resort only because, you know, this is much more invasive for our um, older and sick patients. I'm not going to go through each of these. I just wanted to give you, again, a snapshot back, you know, in 2019 that this is, you know, the medications, the dosing, the indications, and um, <laughs> considerations. And, you know, and this also carries over. What I really want to talk about are these two um, cases. So one case, this is an actual case, a 50-year-old male with multiple medical problems, chronic back pain, came in for fevers. Um, his CAT scan showed diffuse dilation of the colon. Um, he, at home, he was actually treated with an opioid that, wasn't, uh, that, we, that did not actually came, uh, you know, to be until much later. Um, and he ended up with um, some top water enemas. There was definitely escalation and combined a combination of all the different um, classes of medications for constipation management. And then eventually he did receive methyl naltrexone. And then um, there was a, a good bowel movement. And then on the second, on the right hand side, a 34 year old female with mild dyslastic syndrome that transformed to acute leukemia ended up with neutropenic fevers, graft versus host disease. At constipation because of opioid use, because when you have GDHD, a lot of them have pain, and was given, you know, a lot of these laxatives, was given methyl naltrexone, and then a day later, bowel movement um, happened. Which brings me to opioid induced constipation, which is part of a larger syndrome called opioid induced bowel dysfunction. So you actually need to meet criteria. Rome 4 updated the criteria to, um, to say that these are patients who are already on opioids and there's an abnormal change from their baseline, defined as less than three per bowel movements per week, development of worsening or straining, of, uh, or straining to pass bowel movements, sense of in incomplete evacuation, harder soul consistency, and perception of distress. So we know that the pathophysiology is mediated by the mu opioid receptors because that's where the opioids bind. Um, and therefore, consequentially, it reduces bowel tone and contractility, it increase, increases the anal sphincter tone, there's decreased um, reflex relaxation and reduced gastrointestinal propulsion with um, alteration in the autonomic health flow. So I wanted to uh, highlight this slide because of the PAMORAS. PAMORAS stands for Peripherally Acting New Opioid Receptor Antagonists. And there are a few that are you know, uh, that are on the market. Methyl naltrexone is one, naloxone, the combination of oxycodone, naloxone, naloxigol, naldemidine, alimopan, acelopram, with PAN, which is not available in the US. So I wanted to just point that out because part of my objective here is to provide recent updates. So maybe the only one that I really wanted to talk about is the methyl naltrexone since this is the one that is the most used. 
So um, the good thing about methylnaltrexone overall is that it does not reverse central analgesia. The effect is only in the peripheral setting. So therefore, you have a patient who's in acute uh, chronic pain who has opioids, constipated, you can use methylnaltrexone without worrying about whether their pain is going to exacerbate because they're not going to exacerbate with methylnaltrexone. It is given sub Q. It has to be weight-based. Um, there is an oral formulation um, here. We tend to use the sub Q. Metabolism is in the liver, and excretion is in the, the feces and the biliary and, and renal. And then you have these other um, peripherally acting agents. I'm not going to go into them. I just wanted to show them for um, data purposes. Uh, they're newer, and I've included some of the basic pharmacokinetics in case you are interested in you know, reading up. Um, I will highlight, though, that of all of these newer agents, only the albimopan has a black box warning for causing acute coronary syndrome, especially MI. These are other agents that are non-opioids, but our GI folks actually use lubiprostone for people with IBS, metaclotide, procaloprine. And again, these are agents that we use, and um, I just put this slide here to highlight that these are um, currently in use. And, and you know, and it's available in the U.S. So what is, in fact, the evidence behind methyl um, opioid induced constipation? So I wanted to highlight that they compared all of these newer agents, right? So this was a 2019, if I'm not mistaken, data. They com um, systematic review, they compared all these newer agents from naloxone, to albimopan, um, naloxicol, and they also compared it to non- um, to medications that have a different uh, effect other than uh, you know, blocking the neuroreceptors like the bupostone and propylopride. And what they found is that the relative risk is, 0.60, uh, is less than one. If your relative risk is less than one, it means that, for those of you who are not statistically inclined, it means that there is more benefit than harm. If it goes beyond one, then there's definitely more harm. And they are statistically significant. So we know that all of these medications actually work and there's data to support this. Last five minutes. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to uh, breeze through the last one really quickly. So AA is a 75-year-old female, type 2 diabetes, major depression. She came to him with altered mental status, numerous psychotropic medication, started to improve. <coughs> and then she had poor appetite. She became hypoglycemic. She required B10 infusion. And then a collaborating specialist recommends a cyanide medication. So this is an actual case that I took care, we took care of. And the question here is how do we proceed? Should we augment her appetite by giving her appetite stimulants? <coughs> so we need to differentiate anorexia, which is loss of appetite, and protection, which is weight loss. Um, loss of weight that is unintended is more primary cachexia as a function of their primary illness and or the, uh, related to the or associated with the primary illness. But secondary cachexia is the one that's really related to the second to the primary illness and that this is secondary to um, inadequate oral intake. So you have to rule out reversible causes as such. There's a lot of them. You want to be able to clarify goals and also think about that there's really no evidence for improved survival to pharmacotherapy to these agents. And then you need to do your counseling, piece, which is really important to um, uh, inform family members and caregivers. Um, and if there is consistency with the goals, then you might maybe consider, but try non-pharmacologic first before you do any pharmacologic therapies. So we've already looked at all these agents from before. I'm not going to get into them. But what I read, and these are, again, more um, definitive tables as to how to use them. What I wanted to show you is data. So this was a data that um, compared dronapinol, medrosol, mirtazapine. In this analysis, which was done in 2019, again, this is a recent one, this is amongst inpatients, right? So the most commonly uh, recommended or prescribed medication is mirtazapine because it promotes weight gain, it helps with appetite, it helps with anxiety and, and depression. Even though there is no statistical difference, what we see is we do see a trend that a lot of these agents are um, about the same when it comes to improvement, let's say, in renal intake. Like, for instance, with this one, you know, more than 70 to 80% of patients improved in their original intake. 
and um, the mean weight for for these patients are sort of hovering in the same uh, areas as well. If you look, if you skew them into some kind of a, of a graph, and there are, there's also a section in multi, uh, multiple agents here that they use a combination of one or the other. So it says here that there's really no difference in change in meal intake or weight between the three of them, but there is a trend for numerical improvement. A lot of these medications are started in the outpatient setting. And when you are in the inpatient uh, setting, this is actually in a hospitalist group that, that was done, um, what, they, uh, what they figured out is that a lot of these patients do come with acute stress, and so they have you know, a lack of appetite. But we also know that when they come in, they are acutely ill, they might not like the food. There are many other things that, that will contribute to this. So the bottom line is that all three are sort of on the same level. You just need to kind of pick and choose which one. And in terms of uh, Megase and Trinabinol, there is very low quality of evidence. So even though Magistrol is probably a, a tad bit better than Trinabinol, which is Trinabinoid, the quality is very low. Plus, you have to deal with side effects, right? PBT and you know, fluid retention and whatnot. It actually completes my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys still awake? What, yeah. what do you typically recommend for like a, a typical dementia patient who has decreased appetite and propensity as a family is asking? Right. So, um, and this is assuming that the patient is completely not able to stay sick and. Like assuming. No, not not, it's, it would be safe to eat. It would be safe to eat. Yeah. I think that, um, first of all, I would counsel them to say that the evidence shows that there's really no good data to support that this is, in fact, going to increase appetite and weight gain. However, if you can, sometimes what I do, depending on the goals, is that I will tell them this is the data, these are the potential adverse effects. Perhaps we can you know, meet in the middle and talk about what our goals are, and we can, we can try you know, we can put it into a trial because, um, you know, some people are really strongly um, with conviction, really think that, you know, appetite stimulation and then improvement of nutrition is something that is, you know, a loving thing to do. And otherwise, they're going to be killing them in that way. So I put them uh, into a test and I could and I the data of the three of them, the one that I would pick is probably going to be mercazapine. Because the data for genabinol and megase are only for HIV and cancer patients. There's really no good data for. Um, so there's now a newer. Um, so I didn't. I, I kind of breezed through it. But there's another agent called ciproheptadine, which is an which is very active. It is like um, H1, yeah, an old agent, an H1, and an also has a serotonin component to it. So the data in ciproheptadine has been well shown in pediatric patients and younger adults. They did the study in 2019, that was again recent, and what they found was that in older adults, more than 65, it did not have really any reasonable effect. However, the sample size was also very low. So they were like, okay, I think we need more studies with this. But to, so that might be something. So I think that it has to be goal-directed. Um, if you were to try, mirtazapine would be the one that I would choose. I would uh, tell them about the risks and benefits. And then the mirtazapine, you don't really see appreciable weight gain and appetite until four weeks after you've started it. And you typically start at 15. 7.5 you start. 7.5 is the sedating dose. Um, so 7.5 and 15 are the sedating doses. However, um, because, you know, patients do get confused and become delirious, I, I tend, we tend to err more on the, on the lowest dose. So 7.5 and then you titrate it in about a week or two to 15 up to a maximum of 45 milligrams. When you hit 15, that's when you actually get most back for your body. That's when you really start seeing the effect. So the 7.5 is really more to help, you know, gauge their their reaction to it if they can tolerate it. Because I have patients who have cognitive impairment that have started on Remeron and it went the opposite, that they had more cognitive decline because they don't have reserves to begin with. Yeah. Um, what do you what do you see as like the trend with the cannabinoids? Like, do you think the data there just isn't enough data yet, and it will show benefits? Do you think it's just popular because people are interested in it? And so it's both. So, it doesn't work. Like, so actually, there's ongoing study now in I want to say Australia, Australia and the UK. 
and this is from my literature review, that they're now trying to look at all these different formulations from herbal. They really are convinced that there is some benefit. They they're just don't have, because there's a lot of exclusions when you when you go into this test, right? You can't really um, extrapolate the findings towards um, pregnant women or, you know, the ones that are severely old or severely frail, you can't really, like, extrapolate. I think that there might be some data, I definitely have seen it, like, um, improve some patients. Um, but whether to generalize it and to have better outcome, I think that there's more work to be done. I do think that there is some, there is um, merit to the effect of, you know, cannabinoids in, in certain populations that are that are truly going to benefit from it. And these are mostly patients who have chronic illness from pain and or with nausea and vomiting. And typically, a lot of them are, um, like you know, like multiple sclerosis is a great. Um, uh, disease that has tremendous benefit, you know, in terms of um, the, the cannabis use. The cancer and then the HIV, it's kind of like back and forth. But then again, you're also limited in terms of like the sample sizes that you can, because, you know, for, for those who are who have cancer, they might be also in their advanced stage and you can't really like, and that's when they have the most symptoms. It's not necessarily in the, the newer um, field. Uh, I will say that the herbal, you know, it's, it's being, it's recreationally sort of sanctioned. Um, I think that there's more to be done. I, it's, it looks promising that if we can isolate and study it more, that it could, in fact, that, that there could be merited. So I'm, I'm optimistic that you know um, that it will be helpful. Um, and uh, from a personal standpoint, I fully support um, cannabinoids. Uh, you know uh, that I think that they they could be really helpful. I just don't have enough data to back it up. But again, you know, it's not to say that um, it cannot be applied or not case by case basis. I think that if you're out of options and it's worth a try and it's not going to be too much risk and or the risks are something that the patients will be agreeable on, I would put it into a test. That's how we get information is sometimes to do trials. And in a way you're doing your own experimental trial provided there's complete informed consent. Because if you're really like backed up and you don't have any other option and then you have pharmacotherapies that are rate limiting because of the side effects, then what do you do? You know, your patients are like looking at you. Go ahead. Mine was back on the first case with opioid infusion was and vomiting, and then we said that I mean, to whether or not it was effective, or, you know, the, the opioid, do you introduce the symptoms or what the symptoms say to the alternatives? So, um, so, if, so I will say that, um, first of all, it's very challenging, particularly if you have multiple causes of potential nausea and vomiting. What I will say, though, is this. If you've started an opioid therapy and um, you have, let's just say you have baseline nausea and vomiting, and then you started an opioid therapy, and then immediately after you take that medication, there's more nausea and vomiting, and or it escalates as you increase the dose of your opioids, then chances are the opioid-related effect is probably driving the shift. Not discounting the fact that you still have other, um, you know, contributing causes. But that's how I kind of gauge. Um, in large part, it's really difficult unless I've definitely like started them on an opioid and then I monitor them and then I see that they have more of the nausea and vomiting. So it, it's, it's time dependent when you initiate the medication. It's much more difficult if you have chronic opioids. So for the most part, so this is the other thing, nausea and vomiting related to opioids, there is a window when the nausea and vomiting actually abates. Um, and usually we would say that it's anywhere from a day to about seven days. When you achieve steady state, the nausea and vomiting actually abates. What remains is really just the constipation piece. So unless you've started a new opioid and or escalated a new opioid and then they have because that's that's it's a it, it's also is a bonus and it's not a, not a bonus but it's a dose effect. If you you increase the the, the opioid, you, chances are you know because that's a new baseline for the patient, they will have more nausea and vomiting. Right, and then when, where do you draw the line between treating one symptom and then treating another a side effect without the medication, right? I just want to ask, how long do you give the patient before they start to vomit? So the duration for us, yeah, no, so you have to wait at least for a month actually for it to work. If the patient is saying that my appetite is better, I'm gaining weight, then you continue it. There's no time cut off. 
the only time limit to Remeron is if they develop adverse effects and you've seen that they've stagnated and it doesn't improve their appetite anymore. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.